Welcome to St. Mary's Harefield Stream Service for Sunday, the 31st of July, 2022, the seventh Sunday after Trinity. Our opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, is based on a poem written by St. Francis of Assisi in the year 1225. It was entitled The Canticle of the Sun, and it's based on Psalm 148, which calls on the whole of creation to praise God its creator. The words were translated into English by William Draper, a clergyman who paraphrased the canticle and set it to music. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia.
Let us pray. A collect for the seventh Sunday after Trinity. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of your great mercy keep us in the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We also pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you would like to get hold of a piece of bread and keep it until later in the service, we're going to be sharing this together. The Old Testament reading is Psalm 4, verses 1 to 8, and it's a psalm of David. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us, bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 4, verse 8. The words of King David, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now, King David may have written this psalm in the context of his son Absalom's rebellion. This is the setting, quite clearly, of the previous psalm, Psalm 3, just before it. And if so, then David is running for his life from his rebellious son, Absalom and a host of traitors who had also turned against David. Sleep doesn't come easily when we have something to worry about. And David certainly had this, not for the first time. He'd found himself running away from the jealous King Saul, having to hide in places like the cave of Adullam and the desert of En Gedi. At least 12 Psalms emerge out of David being in situations of fear and danger. And here in Psalm 4, whatever the historical context, David finds himself able to trust God in the midst of his problems and to find some peaceful, restorative sleep. In today's disturbed world, a good night's sleep seems to be becoming a rarer commodity. Arianna Huffington, in her book Thrive, makes quite a point of this. She says, when life becomes an endless to-do list, it's difficult to put things aside each night and let ourselves fall asleep and connect with something deeper. She asks, what is success? And her answer is this. It is being able to go to bed each night with your soul at peace. It really helps for us to discover what King David experienced, that sleep is healing, important and possible even in the midst of stress. Psalm 127, verse 2, traditionally ascribed to David's son Solomon, says this, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for the Lord grants sleep to those he loves. So one simple and important thing we might do is to work at getting routine quality sleep. Matthew Walker, in his book Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams, says this, that sleep is the single most important thing we can do to reset our brain and body health each day. 
He also says that the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. Sleep enhances our memory, makes us more creative. It lowers food cravings. It protects against disease, lowers the risk of heart attacks, strokes and diabetes. It makes us feel happier, less depressed and more and less anxious. Sounds a good deal to me. There are many techniques we can learn and employ to sleep better. There are books full of these and they can be useful. But here's a technique from the Bible. As we settle down to sleep each night, why don't we say Psalm 4 verse 8 as a little prayer? It was good for King David 3,000 years ago. Maybe it will work for us. And we could learn this verse and then we'll know it to pray it before we enter the land of Nod. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Our second hymn mentions sleep, as it puts it, slumber sweet. God that madest earth and heaven was written in 1827 by Bishop Reginald Heber, when he was vicar of Hodnet in Shropshire. Heber was inspired by hearing the Welsh tune Ar Hida Norse, this live long night. So the words were written to fit the tune. Well, actually, Heber wrote the first verse. On hearing this, someone else was inspired to write another verse. In 1835, Richard Waitley, Bishop of Dublin, added a verse which was a paraphrase of an antiphon used for the Nunc Dimittis at Evensong. The whole hymn is a prayer for safety and protection when we're asleep both at night and then beyond this life. God that madest earth and heaven, darkness and light. Today's Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. It's Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. 
Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Luke chapter 12, verse 14. Jesus replied to someone in the crowd, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Jesus is asked a question about which there was much debate taking place at that time. Luke 12, 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? What's going on here? What appears to be the case is that a father has died and has left the inheritance to his sons. The elder of these sons is following the practice, which is common at this time, that the father's property stays together, that they farm it together or look after it together. But the younger son who calls out to Jesus is wanting to split his property from his brothers. He wants to be independent. So he says to Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And the custom is to ask a rabbi to arbitrate for them. But Jesus the rabbi is having none of this. He refuses to become involved and basically says, I haven't come to sort out every little problem and dispute that you have. Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? The first century historian, Jewish historian, Josephus, writes about the practice of not splitting an inheritance. The advantage being, as he puts it, that everyone's possessions are intermingled with every other's possessions, and so there is, as it were, one patrimony among all the brethren. The words of Josephus. But Jesus doesn't take any particular view of this custom. Rather, he goes on to talk about the deeper issue behind things like this. Verse 15, then he said to them, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. We have to learn for ourselves, and every generation needs to learn for itself, that life is not about acquiring possessions, about owning or having things. I will introduce every funeral service with the scripture, We brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Jesus tells a story, a parable, that highlights a character who is acquisitive and greedy and gets it all wrong. Luke 12, 16 to 19, and he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain, laid up for many years, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He decides to build bigger barns to store all his extra grain after his bumper harvest. This might be a shrewd businessman who plans to keep his grain until there is less competition, and then the price will be higher when he sells it. But the man in the parable forgets one key thing. Verse 20. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? He forgets that he's going to die. In fact, in this story, he dies quite suddenly. So he doesn't benefit at all from all that he has. And he hasn't put anything into his preparations for eternity. Because of this, he is described as a fool. Verse 21. This is how it will be, says Jesus, with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Life is on loan from God. Our life will in the end be demanded from us. The loan will be called in. All our lives are on loan from God, all of us, and can be recalled at any time. 
So, we who are listening into this story in Luke's Gospel, and for us it's years later, are left with a question ringing in our ears. What does it mean to be rich towards God, or wealthy towards God? The answer may be simpler than we think. It may be found in the summary of the law given by Jesus that we are to love God and love our neighbour. These are the very things we don't see in this shrewd businessman whose values were upside down. Life for him is all about him. It's been said that when a person is wrapped up in themselves, they make a pretty small package. In contrast, Paul the Apostle writes these words to young Timothy as he takes on the leadership of the church in Ephesus. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. This parable comes in between two passages that contain instructions not to worry. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Luke 12, 7. And, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Luke 12, 22 to 23. The point is that the things we worry about are often not the most important things. The most important question is, what is the most important thing? Our next hymn was written by Francis Ridley Havergal, a 19th century English, English religious poet and hymn writer. She was born into an Anglican family at Astley in Worcestershire. Her father was a clergyman, writer, a composer and hymn writer and Francis supported, in practical ways, the Church Missionary Society. She wrote the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated Lord to Thee. She was a good singer and a brilliant pianist. She learnt several modern languages, as well as Greek and Hebrew. With all her education, however, she had a very simple faith and a confidence in God. She never wrote a line of poetry without praying over it. The hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated Lord to Thee, by Francis Ridley Havergal.
We come to our prayers and are going to light a candle for the people of Ukraine in their continuing ongoing conflict. So let's pray. We pray for Ukraine and its ongoing onslaught by Russia as it seeks to retake the southern city of Kherson in its counter-offensive. Lord, help us to be rich in spirit and generous to others. We pray that the Commonwealth Games would celebrate sport achievement and consolidate relationships between the countries of the Commonwealth in the changing world of today. Lord, help us to be rich in spirit and generous to others. We pray for the 600 bishops of the Anglican Communion who are meeting at the Lambeth Conference in Canterbury for dialogue, fellowship and direction. Lord, help us to be rich in spirit and generous to others. We pray for those affected by the extreme weather conditions with wildfires or flooding in different parts of the world. Lord, help us to be rich in spirit and generous to others. And we pray too about the global rising cost of living, for a more equitable sharing of the world's wealth and resources. Lord, help us to be rich in spirit and generous to others. We pray for Alex and Lucy, who were married at St Mary's yesterday, and we pray for all those who are ill. We ask for healing for Arlo, Andrew, Andrew Garner, Barbara Leake, Beryl Harold, Brenda Davis, Candy Hamlow, Carlene, Elaine Cantwell, Emma, Eunice Haswell, Gareth Williams, Gregory Ash, John Butler, Lewin, Neil, Neil Osgood, Peter, Ruth Gookie, Trevor Chidgy, and Jill Pepperell. And we pray for those who grieve for their loved ones, especially those who grieve for Jean Dobson, Lily Whitehead, Tony Smith, Betty Vost, and for Anne Dent and Stephen Hart, whose ashes will be interred today. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The hymn Love Divine was written by the prolific hymn writer Charles Wesley in 1747. It has become one of the best known and best loved of his hymns. It has been set to many different tunes in its history, the most popular at present being the Welsh tune 
blind wound. Love divine, or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth, come down. We come to that point in the service we're going to share bread together as a symbol of our fellowship across the world, across time and space, our togetherness. And I'm just going to fetch my piece of bread now. As I break this bread and we share in various places, we are conscious of being together. We're also conscious of being very dependent on things that are in short supply these days and difficult to get around the world. The grain in Ukraine, for example, a loaf of bread has increased in price quite a lot and is going to go up again. So we pray for all these kinds of things as we share our bread together, as we hear a tune on the flute.
St. Mary's Church is open this week to visit and for to find prayer and peace tomorrow Monday from 10 to 2, Wednesday from 10 to 2 and Saturday from 10 to 1. There is a midweek service as usual uh, in, on Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the Church Hall Chapel in the High Street. On Tuesday, the monthly Stitch in Time group is meeting at the Church Hall at 2 p.m. All are welcome to come along for a craft afternoon and you can bring your favourite craft to do if you would like to. On Friday, the first Friday walk is going to do something slightly different. We meet at 10 a.m. at the Church Hall car park as usual and everyone of course is welcome to come to that uh, walk. Then we're going to walk along the canal towpath as far as Uxbridge and then catch the bus back to Harefield. Um, alternatively, if you would like to go part of the way and walk back again, you can do that too. There are some various options here. We're not <laughs> saying you have to come all the way, go all the way to Harefield, uh, to Uxbridge rather, from Harefield, um, but the option is there, and then we'll just get the bus back at the end. The first Friday lunch at the Church Hall is from 12.30 until 2 p.m., and we will get back from the walk in time for that, that's the plan. Um, with the walk, uh, with the lunch rather, just come along. Um, £4 for a simple lunch of soup, plowmans and a cuppa. And cake is 50 pence extra. Next Sunday the service will be at the usual times, 8 o'clock communion and 10.30 communion in church. There will also be a service streamed at 10.30am. The hymn, Lord of All Hopefulness, was written by Jan Struther, 1901-1953. She wrote many poems and hymns, being a native of London, but she died, in fact, in New York. This hymn is based on one of the best examples, rather, of an all-day hymn, asking for God's abiding presence throughout each moment of each day. Each of the four stanzas, in turn, asks for God's providential care at the break of the day, the noon of the day, the eve of the day, and the end of the day. God is in every moment of every day in the whole of our lives. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy.
We end our service as usual with a poem. The Anglican poet Mike Malcolm Geit wrote a poem in 2019 that was set to music as an anthem to address the extreme weather events of that time. He saw this extreme weather as being a divine wake-up call for the Church to prayerfully address the crisis of climate change in its worship and its liturgy. And the anthem which emerged, written by young composer Rhiannon Randall, was sung at St Michael's Cornhill in February of 2020, before Covid, when wildfires were only in distant countries and 40 degrees centigrade was unthinkable in England. The poem that Malcolm Guide wrote contains a real hope that God will join his voice to the voice of the earth and will rouse us by his spirit, even so late in the day, to repentance and to change for good. It takes the form of a direct appeal to us from nature itself. Poem, Our Burning World, by Malcolm Geit, contemporary poet and former chaplain and life fellow at Girton College, Cambridge. Our burning world is turning in despair. I hear her seething, sighing through the air. Oh, rouse yourself, this is your wake-up call, for your pollution forms my funeral pall. My last ice lapses, slips into the sea. Will you unfreeze your tears and weep with me? Or are you sleeping still, taking your rest? The hour has come that puts you to the test. Wake up to change at last and change for good. Repent, return, replant the sacred wood. You are my children, I too am God's child. And we have both been together, been defiled. But God hangs with us on the hallowed tree. That we might both be rescued and both be free. So let's remember at the end of our service that verse from Psalm 4 and verse 8. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. The words that we can pray just before we fall asleep tonight and every night. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today and always. Amen. The hymn, And Did Those Feet in Ancient Time, was written by the poet and painter William Blake, an important but rather controversial figure of the so-called Romantic Age. He lived from 1757 to 1827. And the poem that gave rise to the hymn was supposedly inspired by the apocryphal story that a young Jesus, accompanied by Joseph of Arimathea, visited this country, travelled to what is now England, and went to Glastonbury. In the more common interpretation of the poem, Blake asks whether a visit by Jesus briefly created heaven in England, in contrast to the dark satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution. Blake's poem asks questions rather than asserts the historical truth of Christ's visit. And the second verse is interpreted as an exhortation to create an ideal society in England, whether or not there was a divine visit here. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? Question mark.